Christ, not of the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. And again, this morning, we thank you uh, and ask that we might behold wondrous things from your word. And Holy Spirit, we look to you as our teacher, the one that takes those things and makes them known to us. And believing that the yoke is being destroyed because of the anointing, and help us again not just to be hearers of the word, Father, but by the grace of God, help us to do what we hear. In Jesus' name, and all the people said, Amen. Well, we have been on a series on calling this coming out of Egypt. And we've been looking at some of the things that we can learn from Joseph's journey into Egypt and God's amazing dream that he put in Joseph's heart and how God led Joseph and actually turned things that seemed bad in Joseph's lives by like, like being sold into slavery and being betrayed and things that in the natural looked dis- destructive and they weren't pleasant at the moment, but Joseph couldn't see the entire picture. He couldn't see that when his brother sold him into slavery and then later how he was betrayed by Potiphar's wife and ended up in the, the dungeon of, of the Pharaoh and how time after time it seemed like he had been betrayed, how he had been let down, how the dream that God had put in his heart didn't seem like it was going to be reality. And actually the, great, the dream of greatness that God had shown Joseph where his brothers would bow before him and his mother and father would bow down before him, that dream seemed to turn into a nightmare. And the truth is, many times in our life, when God puts destiny or puts a dream and a vision in your heart, you're going to face opposition. You're going to face things that make that dream seem like at times it's not ever going to become a reality. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, there's been many times as a pastor of this church where discouragement has come upon my heart and the devil has come and sat on my shoulder and said, you are wasting your time. The dream God put in your heart, it's never going to become a reality. But when we face those things, what we have to do is push through. And we have to fight the fight of faith. Because the devil's not just going to lie down because God gives you a vision. Now again, what I said, I don't believe that it was God's will, you know, Potiphar's wife coming on to Joseph and trying to seduce him. And he said, I, if God be forbid that I should sin up against my God. But God takes the things that the devil brings into your life for destruction and he can turn them around for glory. God can turn things that the enemy brings and people bring and seeming like defeat, and he can turn defeat into victory. You see again and again in the Bible where people that look like it was defeat, what it looks like the story was over, it, they were against insurmountable odds, but yet God by his power and by his spirit turned it around and turned the defeat into victory. I'm going to tell you folks, God wants to turn your, your night into, into mourning and your shame and your sorrow into dancing. Amen? God wants to give you the victory because you already have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we heard the admonition this morning, you're going to have to take up the armor of God and you're going to have to enter into the fray. You're going to have to enter the fight. You know, when God led the children of Israel to the the promised land after they came out of Egypt with Moses and later with Joshua, there were giants in the land. There were enemies in the land. There were obstacles in the land. There were things that came against what God had declared because God prophesied by Abraham that your children and then later told the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt that you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to drink from wells that you didn't dig and you're going to eat from vineyards that you didn't plant. You're going to be a, this land is a delightsome land. This land is a good land. And I want to tell you folks, God has put a good land before you. God has put goodness and mercy before you. And it's God's desire that you prosper and be in health. It's God's desire that you're blessed people. But you're going to have to go through adversity, and you're going to have to learn how to handle hardship. The Bible says, count it all joy when you come into different trials, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh endurance. Jesus learned endurance. Jesus learned obedience, the Scripture says, through the things he suffered. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? So we have to remember that, that when we face adversity in our lives, that adversity, while it's not pleasant at the moment, that God, you have to realize that God will lead you into situations that will cause you adversity. Why? Because he's trying to destroy you? No. God is not the author of our destruction. If it steals, if it kills, if it destroys, it's of the devil. But God will use adversity to test your fiber. God will use adversity to develop your character. God will use what the devil brings to turn around for your glory. And that's exactly what God did with the life of Joseph. And we see that throughout the scripture. It's a scriptural principle. 
Well, the story again goes, Joseph has the wonderful dream. There's adversity and there's discord in this family. His brothers hate Joseph and they end up betraying him and selling him into slavery. He ends up in the household of Potiphar, who's the captain of the guard of Egypt, of the Pharaoh, and Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. He resists that. She gets mad. She says to Potiphar that he tried to rape me, and Potiphar throws him into the dungeon of the Pharaoh. He's in, in Pharaoh's dungeon, but the Bible says throughout Joseph's life, when he's with Potiphar, when he's then in the dungeon, it says that God gives him favor, and the, the, the keeper of the prison puts Joseph in charge of the entire prison. The story goes on that after a time, God sends a uh, cupbearer, the cupbearer of the, of the Pharaoh had offended the Pharaoh and the baker had offended the Pharaoh and God um, shows Joseph they have these dreams while in prison and Joseph interprets their dreams and they happen just as Joseph said well a little while later then the Pharaoh has a dream sent by God first of all the Pharaoh dreams about seven fatted cows that come up out of the Nile River followed by seven gaunt cows the gaunt cows eat up the fatted cow, cows but it, by all look at appearance it doesn't look like they get any fatter then there's seven stalks of grain followed by seven that are good and full and then there's seven gaunt stalks of grain and the, the gaunt ones eat up the, the good ones. Well, later on, uh, the, this is troubling Pharaoh. He calls for the magicians of the land and the wise men and they can't figure out what it means. They're perplexed because it's from God. And when God seals something, no man can open it. And God sent this dream to Pharaoh because God had set the stage to make sure that he prepared a way for his children to not only be fed and taken care of, but to bring them out with a glorious outstretched hand. Amen. So God is orchestrating these things. And at that time, the cupbearer remembers about Joseph and how Joseph had interpreted his dream while he was in prison. And so the cupbearer says to the Pharaoh, I remember this Hebrew. He told me everything that you, what was going to happen, and it happened exactly the way it he told it and uh, so the pharaoh sends for for joseph and overnight they bring joseph they clean him up present him to the to, to the pharaoh and the pharaoh tells him the dream and joseph not only tells the pharaoh what the dream means he says these two dreams are one and the same there's going to be seven years of plenty in egypt followed by seven years of great famine and he says this is what you need to do you need to appoint a wise man over the land of pharaoh and you need to store up 20 percent of the produce over the next seven years put it in granaries put it in storehouses and cities and so that when the drought comes when this famine followed by seven years of famine you don't all starve to death and the pharaoh is shocked the pharaoh is because the favor of god is on joseph i tell you when the favor of god is on you god can move mountains amen move circumstances get your jobs when you couldn't get a job get your pay raises when you couldn't get pay raises Make your enemies at peace when you, when you thought there was no way of that happening. That's the favor of God. So Joseph is appointed. When the Pharaoh hears this, he's astonished. And he says, who else can we find in the land of Egypt but this man? So the Pharaoh takes, takes Joseph and uh, he puts him as the head of the land, only submissive and second in command to the Pharaoh himself. He gives him land, he gives him, Joseph ends up with a wife, he ends up with a family, he ends up with great wealth, and he begins to do exactly what God commanded to do and he, under the command of the Pharaoh, and he begins to store up uh, storage. Well, we know that the story is that there's seven years of abundance, and during that time they're storing away resources. But then the seven years are followed by seven years of great drought. So after, um, after a couple of years of this drought, the land of Egypt and all of the land around becomes barren. There's this great drought going on. And so the story is where Joseph's father, Jacob, and his brothers who are left outside of, of Egypt, they hear that there is food, grain down in Egypt. So Jacob says to his sons, go down to Egypt and get us some grain so we don't starve to death. And of course the story is they all go except for Benjamin, the youngest, who is Joseph's blood brother through Rachel and uh, and anyhow they go down to to Egypt they, and the story is that Joseph tries them he, when he sees his brothers he knows who they are and he says accuses them of being spies and through a series of events Joseph uh, tries them Joseph tests them and what Joseph does is he um, he eventually reveals himself to his brothers and of course they're shocked when they see him and he lets them know that what you meant for my destruction, God meant for the saving of lives. 
And Joseph understands what happened, and he understands how God allowed things to happen and play out that he didn't understand at the time, but now he understands why he put him there and what happened. And so the, the story is, the story is, is that Joseph says to his brothers, go back and bring my father in all of your land because there's five more years of drought. And he said, bring all of his possessions. Bring, he says, don't worry about your possessions because I'm going to take care of you. God has set this up and I'm going to take care of you. What an awesome story we have in that. That in this time of great famine, God had gone before them and made provision to prepare and take care of them. I'm going to tell you folks, God goes before you to prepare a place for you. God goes before you to take care of you. You know, God, nothing takes God by surprise. God, God doesn't look at what's happening around the world to shake it and bake and go, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do to take care of you. God can well take care of us. Amen. If we'll put our hope and trust in him. Amen. So the story is, as they come to the land of Egypt, and Joseph is reunited with his father and with his family, and, and praise the Lord. But not only do they come to the land of Egypt, but Joseph decides and determines to give them what's called the land of Goshen, which he says, and Pharaoh later says, is the best of all the land. It is not only the land of Egypt, but it's the best of the land. And there's a couple reasons that Joseph puts them in Goshen. He puts them there, number one, because Goshen was the best. Amen? It had the, obviously it was the, hot, the best of all the land of Egypt. It has the best resources. But the second reason he put them in Goshen is by putting them in Goshen, he could assure that his family, who worshipped the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, would not be corrupted by the gods and the pagan culture of Egypt. Now this is very, very important to remember as we go along in our study about the children of Israel in Egypt. So it says here in Genesis chapter uh, 47, let's pick up here with verse 5. It says there before the Pharaoh, and Jacob comes in to see the Pharaoh, meet the Pharaoh, and it says, Then Joseph spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and your brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Because Jacob tells, Joseph instructs his family, Jacob, when you go to see the Pharaoh, when he asks you what's your occupation, tell them that you're herdsmen. Because it says that the, any shepherd was an abomination to, to the Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. So he didn't want them to say, we're shepherds. He said, we're herdsmen, we take care of livestock. And I'm not exactly sure why shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians, but they were. It says that throughout Scripture several times. So jo uh, Pharaoh is speaking to Jacob, and he says, if you have, you know, maybe you guys can take care of my livestock as well, because he recognizes the hand of God on them. Now, there's something we have to remember. When they came into the land of Egypt, and again, Egypt is the first prophetic nation mentioned in the Bible. Egypt throughout scripture is predominantly referred to as a type of the world, the type of the system of the world. And John the apostle said, don't love the world or the things that are in the world for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They're not of the Father, but of the world, and the world is passing away. So the point God makes to us, just as he was making to the children of Israel in Egypt, is Egypt was never intended to be a permanent place. Just as this world we live in today was never intended to be a permanent place. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of another world. That's why we as God's people look for a new heaven and a new earth. We look for a city whose builder and maker is God. We look for a kingdom that is to come. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead. We look forward to the day when Jesus Christ will return. That's what we're looking for. Amen? Glory to God. We're looking for that day when Christ himself will return to the earth and set up a new kingdom, not a kingdom of this world, but a kingdom of God. The Bible says the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall rule and reign forever. That's what we're looking forward to. So prophetically speaking, just as the children of Israel came into the land of Egypt and God prophetically said to Abraham, your descendants are going to dwell in a foreign land. But after a season, I'm going to bring them out of that land and make of them a great nation. God later said the same thing, reaffirmed that covenant to Jacob. When Jacob was about to go into Egypt with his family, he said, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. 
For after a time, I'm going to bring your descendants back out of the land, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. Now, we know in the scripture that when Jacob went down into Egypt, it says there were 70 people with him. So his family had grown to 70 people. And so they go and they live in the land of Egypt. Uh, So they're in the land of Goshen, and we remember that this land was not permanent. Now, what we have to remember in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mightily, and the land was filled with them. Now, I want you to take note of something, and that note is this. The first and foremost, when they went into Egypt, they were put into the land of Goshen, and you notice there were 75 people, and they were separate from the rest of the Egyptians. Remember that? But later on, when they came out of Egypt, or before they came out of Egypt, after Joseph and that generation had died, what do we hear in the scripture? It says they multiplied greatly, and it says the land was filled with them. What does that tell us? It tells us that the children of Israel had begun to assimilate and incorporate into the culture of the Egyptians. Now, we know that the children of Israel were in Egypt for about 400 years. Now, they were not slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but they were in Egypt for about 400 years. All of that time in Egypt was not slavery, though. Much of that time in Egypt was a great time of growth and prosperity. And they were just like us, living in the land of America, living in the land of Goshen. But all of a sudden, what happens? We begin to incorporate into the culture. We become, the culture becomes part of us. We know that the children of Israel were involved in all sorts of things they had no business being involved in because when they came out of Egypt, what is the first thing they do when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the commandments and he doesn't come down? It says, let us make for us a golden calf and bow down and worship it. And throughout their, that first generation especially, they had a mindset of slavery and they had a mindset of the Egyptians. They didn't think like God's people. They thought like the Egyptians. They thought like worldly people. They had a worldly Egyptian type of mindset. And you know, when you get raised in something, that something can get raised in you. You know, I say to people, we live in a small community up here and I, I like living in rural America. But the problem with sometimes living in a small town is a small town can live in you. You can live with dwarfed dreams and dwarfed ambitions and dwarfed understanding of the power and greatness of God. Whereas greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? So once sometimes we can look at our circumstances and where we live and what's going on in our lives and it can distort our relationship with God because we become small-minded and small-thinking and God becomes small in our own understanding. And we can become like that first generation that when they finally came to the promised land and they sent spies in to spy out the land and they came back with a report, they brought up an evil report of the land and said, there are giants in the land and we were in their sight as grasshoppers and so we were in our own sight which was a complete lie because we find out later that when Joshua took the children of Israel into the land and they came to the city of Jericho which was the first city that they conquered that when they went in and the spies came in to spy out the land and they met Rahab she said when we heard of your people on the other side of the Jordan our hearts melted like wax within us that was the attitude that the people in the land of promise had of the children of Israel. They were afraid of the Israelites. They were Israelis. They were afraid of God's people. They were afraid of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because they heard what he had done to the other people before them. The Bible says that there was great fear upon the people because of God. And when God comes upon people, moves in people, God can create fear among the nations. I'm telling you, Church of the Living God, when we have a fear of God, the nations around us will begin to have a fear of God. Amen. Amen. So Joseph brings his family into Egypt, and they begin to live in Egypt, and later on we find that Egypt, unfortunately, begins to live in them. So let's go on, and we're going to look at a little bit more here. Now, after this drought becomes severe... It tells us in Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. 
and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So this is the scenario. There's a great famine in the land, so what happens? All the Egyptians, they start coming to the Pharaoh. They start coming to Pharaoh, and they say, we don't have any food, so let's buy food from you. So Joseph, the government, basically has all the resources, right? Because the people have run out of money or run out of food. And they come, and what do they do? They use all their savings. They use all their 401Ks. They use all of what they've got stored up, and they buy food from the government for a year. Now the year goes by, and later on, it says in verse 15, So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Then Joseph said, Give me your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock, if the money is gone. So they brought all their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for their horses, the flocks, the cattle, the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for their livestock that year. So first of all, their money fails. The drought keeps going. They run out. They don't have any money to buy food, so then they bring all of their possessions, their livestock. They bring all their cattle, all their sheep, all their donkey, everything they have, they bring it and they give it to the Pharaoh. What's happening here? We're seeing a wealth transfer, aren't we? We're seeing the people's wealth going into the coffers of Pharaoh. The Pharaoh and Egypt is becoming a superpower at this time. Because not only are, are the Egyptians bringing their money, I believe people from all over the region were probably bringing their money and their livestock to buy food, right? Well, finally, after a while, what happens? Well, their money begins to fail. This is what Thomas Jefferson said. He said, I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. This is why I oppose socialism and I oppose communism because what happens is there is no way that the government takes care of people without losing your freedom. In countries that have predominantly embraced socialism and embraced communism, when you do not have liberty, in other words, when you do not own your own land, you're basically dependent completely on the government. Do you know that less than 5% of Americans at this point own personal property, personal land? Only about 5% of Americans own land. Only about 18% of Americans actually live in rural America now. Do you know that? Rural America is dying because everybody moves to the city. Now what happens when you move to the city? I'm not against cities. I like going to the city. I, there's a lot of great things in cities. A lot of art and a lot of things. And, but what happens when people move in the cities? You lose your independence. You lose the ability. You say, well, we have independence. Well, we know that if, if turmoil and disaster strikes America, the people who live in the city are going to have it much worse than people who live in the country. Because you're dependent on everybody. To, you know, I, I've spoken about this. When you live in the city, the people that live in a city are, have a different mentality for the most part than people who live in the country. I'm not saying that country people have a better mentality, but this is the deal. When you live in a city, people in the city, for the most part, hire everybody to do, do most of their stuff. Whereas people in the country generally don't do that. Well, for one of the reasons is because generally people in the city have more money than people in the country. There's more wealth in cities than there is in the country. Now, that isn't to say there aren't wealthy people who live in the country. But for the most part, the predominant amount of wealth in America is where? In cities. Right? Because that's where corporations have their headquarters. There's more, more factories, more industry, and so on in, in larger metropolitan areas or places where there's, there's uh, more population, which only goes because the money is going to funnel into those areas. So, but but the, the thing is, we also realize is that everything in a city is dependent on everything else. For instance, if the garbage strikes for a week, remember, some of you remember back when the garbage workers struck in New York City back years ago, and garbage was piling up to the top of buildings there are certain things that if they shut them down in the city the city becomes immobilized now what's the problem with that the problem with that is you really have no independence you have no ability to take care of yourself after a while this is why we say if disaster truly hits america and hits our cities the people in the city if if trucks can't go into the city and bring groceries to the city what are you going to do you're stuck right right 
Now, I'm not trying to say this as fearful and gloom and doom. I'm just pointing out something, that the same kind of thing that was happening back here has always been happening through history. And some people say, well, see, this stuff has always happened, so what's the big deal? I'm simply trying to point out some parallels that I think we see in our nation today that are very similar situations. Now, what is happening during this time? What happens when there's want in a land? When there's want in the land, what happens? Just like we see in America, whenever there's want in America, where do Americans look? to the government. In other words, they're going to the government for a bailout, right? And we see this in our nation, you know, when the banks failed uh, back years ago when George Bush uh, Sr. was in office, the savings loan, the government bailed them out. The auto industry failed, the government bailed them out. We see time and time again where people are beginning to what? Look to the government to bail them out. And it becomes a mentality just like the Egyptians where we can't help ourselves so the government is the one we look to to help us. Now what's wrong with that picture? Now God was doing something supernatural here that we're going to see later on. God really was setting something supernatural up. And I believe God is just as supernatural today. Amen? But what do we see when this happens in nations? Well, what happens is you begin selling your autonomy and you begin selling your liberty and you become slaves of the state. Amen? So the Egyptians sold all their lands eventually to the Pharaoh to buy food. In Genesis chapter 47, verse 18, it says, When all that year had ended, they came to them the next year and said to him, We, have not, we will not hide you from the Lord. Our money is gone. My Lord... Also as our herds, our livestock, there's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be your servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field because of the famine was very superior upon them, so the land became Pharaoh's. So what happens? The Pharaoh owns everything. So we see an amazing, because of this drought, we see an amazing wealth transfer into the hands of the Pharaoh. Now, you think Pharaoh's pretty happy with Joseph? <laughs> now, I want you to see something. This is God doing this through God's man. God, God knew this was all going to happen, right? God knew this was going to happen. But there's something very supernatural about this that later on we don't see the whole picture, just like Joseph couldn't see the whole picture when he was sold into slavery. But God is setting the stage for something, something that seems destructive, and at times things that are destructive and seem bad, God in the end can set the stage and turn this thing around completely. It's amazing. Amen. So they sell all their land. They basically become slaves of Pharaoh. They're not really slaves, but what Pharaoh does, what Joseph does, is he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you seed, I'm going to give you livestock, and you're basically going to work for the Pharaoh. And every year, whatever you take from your land, 20% of it comes and you give it to the Pharaoh. So he sets up a tax system, right? Makes sense. What good's the land to Pharaoh if nobody's working the land, right? What good are livestock to Pharaoh if nobody takes care of the livestock? So what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh sets, Joseph sets up a system whereby the people are owned and run, Pharaoh owns everything, and so people are working and Joseph allows the people to have 80%, but they sow back into the government 20% of their increase. So what has he done? He has basically created a government wealth system where the people are supporting Pharaoh for the rest of their lives. I mean, there was no like, okay, after so many years, we'll let you have the land back, right? The land now belongs to Pharaoh. You belong to Pharaoh, and you do what Pharaoh wants, and uh, it'll be well with you, amen? So... We see that this amazing wealth transfer, and what does Joseph do? It says he moved all the people into cities away from the land. Now, that doesn't mean he moved everybody into the city. But what he did is he moved the people that didn't have land, didn't have the means to produce for Pharaoh, into a place where it was easier geographically to take care of them. So, if you think about it again, I said that about 50% of the world's population right now lives in urban areas. This is what Thomas Jefferson said as well. When we get piled upon one another in large cities as in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as Europe. What's wrong with people living in cities? Well, where does most of the wickedness come from in nations? It comes from cities. Why? Because people in the city are evil? No, but because when you put wicked people in an area, wickedness spreads. God understood this when the Tower of Babel. Why did God confound the languages after the Tower of Babel? It wasn't just because they were trying to 
to soothsay and they were trying to tell the future. God confounded the language because God understood if you let the righteous hang out with the wicked, the wicked will pollute the righteous. That's why he always said to his children, come out and be separate. Why do you think he brought them out of the land of Egypt? He brought them out because he could not allow them to stay with the Egyptians because he knew the Egyptians would pollute them. When he brought them into the land of Canaan, he said, you are not to let your sons marry their daughters and you're not to allow your daughters to marry your sons and so on and so forth. You're not to intermarry with these people. What's What's he telling us here? Don't get intimately involved with ungodly people. Have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Why? Because the way of the wicked will corrupt you. This has always been the principle of God's kingdom. God said, come out and be separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. God has always called his people to live a separate life. Does that mean we're not in the world? No, Jesus said you're in the world. But he said, don't live like the world. You know, Brother Rick's talking about lifestyles next week. What's he talking about? Don't let your lifestyle become like the lifestyle of everybody around you. Amen. Because when the church has had a different lifestyle, when we've not lived and acted and looked like the world, it's when we've made the greatest impact upon the world. If you can't tell us from worldly people by our behavior, then there's something wrong with us. Amen. So they sold everything, and they're giving their money and their possessions. Pharaoh owns it all. And the only ones, if you notice in Scripture, the only ones... In verse 22, it says, Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate the rations which Pharaoh gave them, and therefore they did not sell their lands. Now, you notice something. The priests were not subject to the taxation, and they were not subject to selling their lands. This is kind of like the United States Congress (laughs) that passes laws that they don't have to live by. Right? Why? Because the priest, why was... Why did not Pharaoh, why did Pharaoh not tax the priests? Because the priests validated Pharaoh. The priests were the ones that told everybody, this is the Pharaoh, the bright morning sun, and blah, blah, blah. He's, he's God on earth. That's what they said Pharaoh was. They said he was God. So the priests gave voice to Pharaoh. The priests were PR people for Pharaoh. The, peace, the priests ran interference for Pharaoh. The priests are what gave Pharaoh his stature. And so if you take away the priest and he suddenly turns on the priest, the priest might turn on him and he loses his stature. It's kind of like you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Amen? So in verse 27, it says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt and in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Now, this is the other group of people because of Joseph that were not subject to selling their lands and taxation, the children of Israel, the children of God. Amen? So not only are the priests taken care of, but Joseph's family is taken care of. Now, we're going to wrap it up this morning. We're going to pick up here next week. This is where we've been heading all along. And by the grace of God, next week, we're going to get into what we've really been setting the stage for. And this is at, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. It says, And Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This is where we're going to pick up next week. Now I just want to preface what we're going to say next week with this. When you read this at face value, because the text implies that he didn't even know who Joseph was, right? But that could not be true. Joseph ruled in the land of Egypt. Egypt for I think about 80 years Joseph saved the land of Egypt he was married into the priest family his wife was a daughter of one of the priests he was wealthy he was second in command to Pharaoh so that'd be like saying well I didn't know I I, I don't even know who Abraham Lincoln is that's not reality this Pharaoh knew who Joseph was what does it imply it means that he did not have any inkling to live and follow in the steps of Joseph. Because guess what? Not only did Joseph implement God's principles with economics, and not only did Joseph implement some things like that, but I believe under the leadership of Joseph that the children of Israel began to have influence from the God of Israel. 
You know, it's like America. When America was founded, this, this nation was founded upon godly principles. This nation was governed by godly standards. Not that we've always done everything right, just like the children of Israel. It wasn't to say, or the children of Israel, it wasn't as to say there was a revival in the lands and all the Egyptians turned to, jo- turned to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what it's saying. But the principles by which Joseph began to govern were principles from God. And as a result of that, Egypt prospered. The United States of America has governed, been governed throughout its history by godly principles, and that's why America has prospered. But because of in recent years, we have seen leaders in our nation, not only in the Congress, but in the White House and in our judicial system, that have basically been like this Pharaoh, who do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that do not know our Christian values and where we came from. Just as this new Pharaoh said, we're going to go in a new direction. Change has come to Egypt this day. We have the same thing going on in America where we have leaders saying we no longer want to be like America used to be. We want to make America into something that it never has been before. So what is this Pharaoh doing? We're departing from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're departing from anything, uh, uh, anything that Joseph implemented and we're going a new direction. And we're going to see next week that the children of God in Egypt now instead of becoming having the favor of God and blessings of God, suddenly they become the enemies of the state of Egypt under this new Pharaoh. So next week we're going to look at some of the treachery of Pharaoh and how he dealt with Egypt, I mean the Egypt uh, with the children of Israel and how the children of Israel became enslaved to Pharaoh when God had ordained they be in liberty in Egypt. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you and praise you for the mighty truth of the word of God, and we bless you and worship you and thank you and pray that you'll see this, seal these things in our hearts in Jesus' name. Brother Harley, you want to close our service for us today? Glory to God. Amen.